order. The, uh, first, on, first on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Um, there's a few amendments here that I want to make. Um, under the reports, motions, and ordinances, if we can uh, at the I'm trying to find the use of silly there, so I'm uh, Under the, uh, the VTRANS uh, temporary bridge rental agreement, we'll, we'll include uh, the Humane Society is looking for approval for a coin drop. Uh, and we also are going to add in there, just so it's on the record, that we have uh, two liquor licenses to approve. And, and we also want to add a an executive session to talk about personnel matters. Uh, next, we'll open up the public comment or inquiry. So this will be the time that if there's something that's not currently on the agenda that you'd like to uh, bring up or make comments on, uh, just just make sure when you do so, even though we know a lot of you stand up, um, state your name for the record. So Lisa has it, and it sometimes in here because um, there will be some presentations going on this evening. Sometimes in here, the acoustic levels in here is very challenging. Um, so at any point, if, if bear with us. If, if there are issues with hearing somebody, maybe just raise your hand or you know something like that. Make sure we speak clearly when when uh, we have our turn this evening, especially with the windows open. It adds to it, so it would be pretty challenging. So is there anybody a public comment and inquiry? Seeing none, we'll move on. Our first appointment this evening is, um, is a combination um, of Aldrich and Elliott, uh, as well as uh, the state of Vermont representation. In regards to our continuing uh, discussion in regards to the water master plan, um, I think probably maybe to, uh, to make it easier for those who are here this evening that want to hear kind of how we got here, it, it may be better to have um, Tim and Patrick maybe kick off the discussion on kind of um, why the town of Bethel is doing what they're doing. Um, and then after that, Aldrich and Elliot can kind of take us through the where we're at in the process and what our next steps are um, in keeping our schedule with the um, getting to the bond vote. So. Uh, again, my name is Tim Raymond um, with the State of Vermont Drinking Water and Groundwater Protection Division. My position there is on the operations section, operations engineering and capacity development section chief. I've been an uh, employee of the State of Vermont in the drinking water program for 30 years. I first became aware of the uh, town of Bethel's water system immediately following Irene when the uh, yeah, State of Vermont uh, Agency of Transportation was offloading all the, the uh, uh, rock debris uh, for uh, maintenance of uh, 107 and 4 following the flooding there. At that time, I met your town manager, uh, Delbert Cloud, and uh, at that time, the water system was experiencing some uh, water quality issues with coliform bacteria. Uh, and I started to become personally familiar with the condition of the water systems infrastructure, which uh, was immediately identified as being, I'd put it, uh, aging, uh, need of some attention uh, and some repair. Um, and following that time, there's been a number of water line breaks and leaks and that sort of thing. Um, one of the functions that we provide in the drinking water division is uh, we conduct routine inspections of the drinking water system approximately once every three years. 
Um, in that sanitary survey inspection, we uh, uh, try to identify operating conditions, uh, maintenance issues that uh, address the quantity and the quality of water provided to the end users of the system. Uh, uh, the most recent inspection that we conducted was in April of this year. Uh, we had identified a number of uh, sanitary issues of concern, uh, necessary repairs or replacement issues for the water system. Uh, we've been working with uh, your town office, your town manager, to and their consulting engineer to, to uh, approach a planning phase for engineering improvements uh, that can best serve this community so that they can continue to provide uh, both an adequate quantity and quality of water to the users, uh, not only today, but into, into the future. Um, as we get into this uh, presentation, we're happy to, to talk more about these sanitary deficiencies that we identified during the inspection. Um, did you have something you want to say, Pat? Or Patrick Smart, he's uh, in our engineering section. Uh, I'm with the Vermont Drinking Water Groundwater Protection. I work with Tim. I'm the engineering section supervisor. Uh, Tim and I both performed the sanitary survey that occurred in April, and uh, we're both very familiar with the system, the infrastructure, and the deficiencies and challenges that the town's facing. And I'm also happy to answer questions throughout the evening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just and I did make copies of it smaller size and put on the table somewhere. Some available. Okay. Uh, good evening. I'm Wayne Elliott from Maldrigan Elliott. Uh, you can't hear me up there. Just uh, raise your hand or give me a holler. Uh, been very busy over the last few weeks here uh, with the town. Tim's been busy in the field marking things and meeting with trees. Um, I've got Mike Maynard here from my office. We've been you know, actively working on the project over the last few weeks to make sure we keep everything on track here. One of the big things we've done here is gotten the project scope nailed in, so I'll just give you a really brief overview of what's in there right now. Uh, starting on Main Street, uh, just to the west, um, we're going about 2,500 feet up to the intersection with uh, Marsh Pond Road, so that's going to be a new 8-inch water line. All the water infrastructure in the right-of-way is going to be new. Um, new water line, new hydrants, new valves, new service connections. Uh, the Gaco storage tank up here, uh, again, another sanitary survey item is um, need to run underground power up there, so you're going to run it from the... Uh, public right away up to the tennis courts, up the hill to the reservoir. I'm um, going to have automatic level monitoring up there and some other minor site improvements. Uh, we're also going to add water level monitoring down at the uh, Boulevard storage tank. Uh, not going to extend underground power up there, but that's going to be done by solar so the two tanks can work together. Uh, but the GACO is going to be the primary one because of the uh, underground power service. Um, and then on a lot of the side streets here, um, a lot of cleanup. There's a lot of cross country lines, uh, dead end lines, small diameter galvanized water lines that come in all over the place, serve multiple units. Um, so, water line replacements on Cushing, uh, Densmore, about 1,100 feet. That's going to be a combination of 4 inch and 2 inch for domestic. Uh, then on Avon and Livery Road, Again, similar water line replacements, about 700 feet, uh, 2 inch and 4 inch. Again, both those areas, we're trying to put the new water line in the public right away so the town has access uh, for future maintenance, going to be new services, curb stops, and other purposes. And then the last item we have here is there's a new sample station that's um, going to be located down on Pleasant Street. Again, another sanitary survey item. So those are the major components of the water system improvements. So the next thing we did here, we've been working on very actively over the last couple of weeks is uh, updating the construction cost. Um, we have several of these water improvement projects going on around the state. So we use, you know, bid tabs from projects that we've done that we have ongoing. Um, the estimated construction costs. The other thing we do is we extend it out to next February, March of, of 2020 when the project will be advertised for bids. 
the construction cost is just under $2 million. Uh, it's about $1,993,000. I do want to stress that still, we're still working on that a little bit. That could go up or down a little bit. It's not going to go up $500,000, but plus or minus a few percent. And the reason we wanted to kind of nail that in or get it closed so we could you know, explain to the board where we're at tonight. And the other thing we're, we've been trying to do very actively over the last week or so is uh, kind of dial in the state funding package, which we all think is um, very positive news. The total project cost right now is about $2.8 million. So included in that total project cost is the construction cost. We include a 10% construction contingency, which the state requires. We have things in there like legal, easements, um, town administrative costs, short-term interest, engineering costs, permit fees. So that's how we're getting from the $2 million to the $2.8 million. Available funding, um, primarily using the uh, state drinking water revolving loan funding program. A uh, little complicated, so I'll try to simplify this as much as we can. So what we do is we put the total project costs. We met with the state um, middle last week, and uh, Therese and Tim were there. And we kind of went through the total project costs, what they can offer, what's available, and kind of the next, next steps here. The first piece of that is what they call additional subsidies. So for this particular fiscal year, um, this money is first come, first served. There's about a little bit under a million dollars left. Um, but off the total project cost of the $2.8 million, um, the town currently qualifies for 25% off the top. Um, so that means that's money that the town doesn't have to pay back at some point in loan forgiveness. Um, that is first come, first serve. Um, one of the triggers is that the town needs to have a positive bond vote, which is why we're looking to November versus March, so we can try to move things along. So that's a significant, significant amount of money. The second piece of this is what they call disadvantaged subsidy. And what they do is they run the calculations. They include the town's current O&M cost, debt. Um, they look at your current water rates. Um, they also look at the immediate household income of what's within the water service area. And what they used to do, it used to be a sliding interest rate from negative to plus 3%. They don't do the negative interest rate. But what they do is they attach additional subsidy to that to try to bring the interest rate down and get you to qualify for this sub subsidy. So at this point, the town qualifies for 50%. So the remaining costs out of that initial 25, 50% um, of that is coming off the top is loan forgiveness that the town isn't gonna have to pay back. Um, the third piece of this, which is very, very new, and um, kind of Bethel um, raised this question a few weeks ago, and the state's been working on this, is that there's a newer piece for lead-related components, which is also 100% loan forgiveness. Um, so that's the third part of this. Um, we don't have numbers for you tonight, um, something that we're still working on. We've got to work with the state, but especially these areas on Main Street and the side streets where you have galvanized pipeline, getting rid of that is going to qualify you for this additional forgiveness out of the lead related components. We've got some more work to do there, but that is, again, great news because that's money that's coming off what the town is going to have to pay back. So of the total project cost, um, so number one, the additional 25% subsidy, uh, the town is looking at about $675,000. So that's the first come first serve piece that's coming off the total project cost. The disadvantaged subsidy, which is about 50%, um, that's a little bit over a million dollars. So out of this whole funding package, even before we fine tune the lead related components forgiveness, um, the town is looking at approximately a million dollars left and um, that you would have to borrow for the, low, for the water system improvements out of the 2.8 million. Um, that all cleared everybody. I know there's a lot of parts and pieces, but you know, we think that's great. I mean, it's a great funding package and um, this 25% loan subsidy hasn't been around. It was there last year. It's in there this year, but that hasn't been around in the past. So um, very attractive funding package for the town. So right now the anticipated loan payments, and this does not include the lead related components forgiveness. We're trying to be transparent and be realistic. If anything, we'd like to be a little bit conservative at this point. Uh, with the additional subsidy, which is the 25%, uh, we're looking at a little bit over $25,000 a year for an annual loan payment. That's at 40 years, that's at 0% interest. 
Um, without that additional subsidy, the 25%, that would jump up to almost $34,000. So that's roughly the numbers that we're looking at. Um, that does not include the lead related components forgiveness. So for whatever the town qualifies for that, that is gonna be come off those um, annual loan payments. Uh, the recommended bond amount uh, is 2.8 million. Um, that does have to include all the loan forgiveness and loan subsidies. So even the town doesn't have to pay some of that money back, it's still gotta be included in the uh, bond authorization. Uh, we also have a tentative schedule with some milestones. These are all based on a November 5th bond vote. Uh, we're looking at tentatively uh, September 23rd for the select board to approve the uh, bond documents. Uh, there's a public hearing scheduled on October 28th. Uh, and then there's a couple other things that are required to tap into this 25% loan subsidy uh, is getting a construction loan application. So we wanna, we're shooting for November 2011, assuming the bond vote passes on November 5th. And then we have to submit the uh, permit to construct applications. We're trying to get that in early December and set the town up for the best opportunity to tap into this um, 25% additional loan subsidy. Okay. Um, I don't know if anybody on the board has any questions, but I had a few, but, um, so I, I guess on the 25% loan forgiveness, yep. is this a pool of money through the, sta through the state of Vermont? That's right. That is, is this recharged every year? Or That's is this basically the way it is, so this year, it became available as of July 1st for FY fiscal year 2020. Um, when that's gone, it's gone. It's first come, first served. Okay. So and, it, yep. and then let's assume that you know the town hits all all the benchmarks um, here milestones. Yep. I mean, are we sitting in a position where if if the bond vote is voted through on the fifth, that we're looking at receiving this money, or is this do we have any idea that? Gauge that. I mean, Hope, hopefully, the issue is that there's other projects around the state that are competing for that bucket of money. Um, some already have positive bond votes. Others are probably voting in November. But we're trying to lay out the schedule to give you the best opportunity. It's it, when it's gone, it's gone. But we're trying to lay this out so we can accelerate things and move things to give you the best opportunity to qualify for that. Um, if the bond vote doesn't pass in November and you have to go to March, um, it's probably gone. Ashley did feel like lots so we did meet with felt like we were in a good position for that because some people, you know, we just were pretty far along in the process. And as Wayne just outlined, we could have a couple of those documents, the loan document and the permit to construct, those are parts that have to be in. So um, she felt we're definitely in the mix for the 25%. Okay. We just really need a positive bond vote on November 5th. Is there a chance if we didn't get that money in this fiscal year that this project would be ongoing in a way that we could apply again? Or does it not? It Probably not, to because you have to have the whole funding package kind of in place. And when you do the construction loan, um, you know, you have to have kind of everything ready to go and it can't be retroactive because there is money left over from the prior year, but you can't necessarily tap into that if you're already under construction. And then the um, the lead related component. Yeah. Um, I know we're right now we're not talking about it because it's kind of more unknown of what exactly yeah. that might be. But do we have a guesstimate of what piece of pie of that 2.8 million this represents? Is it 10 percent or 25 percent of what we're doing? Or we haven't done the numbers yet, so I'm hesitant. But we think that's a pretty significant piece. Um, it could be as much as maybe half of the one million that's left over. Okay. Um, so it's sizable. It's not five or ten percent. It's a, it's a pretty good sized number. Um, why we're we're not trying to? This is the first time the states really kind of agreed to this. This is very very new. So we've got some work to do with them in each of these areas and present the cost. But it's it's a sizable number. It's not five or ten percent. Um, would you guys speak to that? Probably. Well, what I can tell you is that we know communities contain lead, you know, contain piping, lead containing materials. Um, but you're not unique in the fact that most communities say, yeah, we, we might have some, but in order to qualify for this forgiveness, you actually have to identify it. Yep. So you're scampering right now to be ahead of the curve and actually identify probably what you already know exists. Mm -hmm. So if you can meet these deadlines, 
you're highly likely to qualify for this this land abatement. So does that cover just removal or removal yes. and installation of replacement? Removal and installation. Covers it everything. Covers 100% yeah. yeah. everything. Yeah. So it's not just a water line, it's the pavement restoration, it's all that that goes along with it. So that's why it's a pretty good sized number. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I just want to add in that similarly to the 25% additional subsidy that Wayne was talking about earlier, this uh, money that's set aside for uh, addressing lead containing components of drinking water infrastructure. There's a limited amount of money that's available in that pot, so to speak, and it's available on first come, first serve basis. Uh, similarly, it's set up that you need to hit certain milestones and be ready to proceed with construction is a key component of that. Um, so if the town, with a successful bond vote and moving rapidly ahead through construction permitting, bidding and construction that puts you well positioned to be in the mix for getting that money. But if the project's deferred, that money may not be available in the future. Other communities may come in and get it. I actually, um, my name is Brad Andrews. Um, so I actually have two issues. First with this, the, uh, with regard to the lead, is the amount of money that the town receives if I'm understanding it right, it's not relative to the amount of material you're pulling out. You're going to test and determine how much contamination there is, and then that amount of money will be decided based on the scope of that project. Is that One hundred percent of the work associated with, with removing the lead-containing components is eligible. What we don't know is how much of it is in the ground. So, is the amount? Of, I guess my question. The amount of subsidy that the town receives, is it relative to the amount of material that you're removing? Yes, for the lead. Okay. So it's like a recycling program almost, basically. Okay. It applies to the outline pipeline, so that's still trying to verify <coughs> what's where. I mean, Tim's finding this on a weekly basis with some of his leaks and test pits, so that's a little bit of the unknown, is just kind of make sure we verify, we understand what's there and document it. Yep. Okay. And that's the thing I had actually for a slide board. Um, so if I understand this right, I think, well, I, I think it's really important that the community to pass this bond vote understand that it's not this program that we're just deciding to do. Um, I mean, I, I mean, as most of you know, I get a lot of questions at my store, um, and, I, and I don't think that many people understand that this is not an optional program for Bethel. So I would ask the five of you to put out there that you know, this is what ha this is why the, it has to happen. The bond has to pass; otherwise, we're going to miss out on a 25% subsidy and all this other stuff. I don't think people are going to get that. I think they're going to hear 2.8 million dollar bond. The town is on the hook for the whole thing. You know, they're not going to understand all these contingencies. So I would ask them to do some kind of flow chart, some kind of something that shows that it has to happen. It's not really. Yeah, yeah, so that's, we'll, part of so we, that's going to be part of the public education outreach tonight. Was just to give you guys just a really rough overview. Um, there's going to be, you know, one of the things we do is we do an information flyer, um, and it's a Q and A thing. And it's exactly that: is why is this required? It's because you got a sanitary survey and you've got deadlines, and this needs to be done. Um, that's going to be distributed around. We have tacos. Could be. It's going to be mailed to yeah, every so all the residents. Totally agree with that. Tonight was just to give the board kind of a brief overview of where things are at. But um, and these guys will also be at those meetings too to talk about the need and why it's required. So, in fact, the, the the town is under an operating permit that contains a schedule of compliance that requires certain work to be done to address these sanitary deficiencies, irregardless of the identification of whether the materials are lead containing, the lines need to be replaced. Right. So I mean in other words, you know, right now, regardless if if we do it next year with taking advantage of the funding that's that you know we currently um, have, you know, we need the town needs to go forward with the project. You know, and um, I guess, you know, 
typically, typically when you, um, you know, you wait 40 years or 50 years to, uh, to do work like a water line and you don't have any type of schedule like we haven't done, you know, usually you're going to pay two or three or four or five times the cost because you waited so long. Um, you know, there is an opportunity for us to do a large chunk of our water line right now and, uh, you know, and, and come away with, you know, our contributing factor being, you know, limited um, compared to, you know, I don't know if we could afford $2.8 million, but, you know, I, I'm sure that we can afford, you know, a half a million to a million dollars, you know, so a little more appetizing. I think it will be very important in the community to make sure that that the information, well, obviously we'd like to have as many people here as possible. We know that doesn't always happen, um, but it, it's gonna be very important to get the information out, um, correct information, and if you hear people, you know how it is, that someone gets a piece of information and then they pass it along to somebody else with a little different information, eventually it's, you know, you know, all point eight million dollars, you know, exactly. you know. So it's going to be all of our parts here to make sure if we hear that in the community that we correct that, um, because you know this bond vote won't be a, a town meeting vote where we stand up and you know vote for it after we just talked about the article. This is going to be you know everybody's going to come in on election night and and yay or nay, you know. So there could be a lot of potential uninformed voters that. So it's going to be really important that. You know the board, the town, and Aldrich and Elliot make sure that we get the positive um, information out there. So, and and we will also talk about a little bit later tonight. Of, you know, possibilities of having some more meetings. You know, we, we are required to have one informational meeting prior to bond vote. However, you know, it might be more beneficial to have multiple meetings to you know get that information out. But. And we will use Front Porch Forum and Facebook and, you know, and, and uh, Zoe DeMarco's here today from the Herald to put an article in there. And, but we just want to say thank you for supporting the bond, and that's great, and that's what we need is people out there, you know, talking about it. But we certainly realize, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint, to kind of get all the information out. But certainly appreciate your support in that. Are you going to send a mailing? We are, yes. Yep, in October. And will it have that diagram in... I'm not sure. That may be difficult to reproduce, you know, to make it readable. I'm not really sure. That's probably something that Tim and Wayne and Mike and I will hammer out. Um, but it'll certainly have all the questions and answers about. But about you'll it. have like a chart showing how much the 2.8 million and then the 25% reduction. Yep. And that way. I think that's very important. I agree. I really agree. That way people can see that and, and um, hopefully by then we'll have some idea more about the uh, lead and to see what that number looks like too. So, absolutely. Yeah. What about the apartment building and people that like water wise, are they going to be out for a while? They will be during the construction, yeah, you know, but try to communicate with people. Uh, you know, we, we have a full-time person in the field, you know, the town will have staff out there. Try to minimize that, you know, the, obviously the business is an impact. So, um, try to get the new water line in, get it there, get it tested, start tying people over so we can minimize that. But, you know, we're going to have to reconnect people, so there is going to be some disruption. We want to make sure we communicate with people ahead of time yeah, as best we know, can. So. Yeah, Yep. Yeah. It's not going to be days at a time. Oh, no, no, it's, no, 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 it's okay. days, it's yeah. days, but yeah, um, yep. But we're, you know, we want to say it's going to be next Wednesday, it's going to be from one to three, or oh, that's whatever, okay. that kind of stuff, right, yeah. so. No, no, it's not going to be days or weeks, absolutely not. Yeah. Um, but just to make sure we coordinate, because even the business to be out for a couple yeah. of hours. <laughs> yeah, and maybe there's a better time, maybe there's a better time and day to do it, too, to make sure that communication happens. <laughs> So will there be at some point in time a breakdown of the logistics and, and some ideas about what step will happen first, where the digging will begin, the dates, rough dates, things uh, like that? There will be some general stuff in the contract. They're going to have a duration. Uh, we are going to have a basic sequence of work. Um, we have to be a little bit careful about that because we can write certain requirements and we definitely can do that where it's appropriate. But we also can't necessarily define the needs and methods of the contractor. We can kind of tell him where to start, which way to go. 
Um, but beyond that, you know, he's got to get the work done within that window. And then it's important for the guys in the field on a weekly basis to communicate and say, you know, next week we're going to be working on this. We're going to start these property owners. So property owners, that happens, no. that's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> one other question I have was. Uh, so you said the total project cost is 2.8 million. The you know current estimated construction cost, let's round it up, is two million dollars. Yeah, so, and of that, um, so the, of that 800 thousand that's left over, that that goes between the the 10 percent construction contingency, yep. permitting, uh, engineering costs, and that. Do, do we have a breakdown of what yes. we think that will be and? Yes, we'll get a chance to look at it. Yeah, we do. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything else unforeseeable that we could run into? I mean, I've I've been a part of these types of jobs in the past, and I've I've been through some nightmare jobs. Um, I I know that we we have concrete slabs in the downtown. That is anticipated. That, okay. Uh, and we spent quite a bit of time <laughs> at the uh, thirty percent review meeting. We we. Initially, what we were doing was we were trying to map the existing conditions, and that's been a big help from Tim's standpoint, is like just verifying what's where. Uh, and we found that with all the utilities out there, we had some pretty limited routes with the new water line. Um, we are going to be under the concrete roadway. Um, that was really the better place for it because of um, separation from existing storm, keeping the existing water line in service. Um, so we did look at some options, and those have different costs associated with them. Um, we do have in the budget to remove that side of the concrete roadway and pull, put back a um, full roadway subbase there. So that is accounted for. So what? So the complete. <clears throat> so the completed project will still have, you know, half concrete road right. underneath yeah, it. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. From, an, from an eligibility standpoint, the state isn't in the business of this program of paying for roadway reconstruction. Um, so they'll consider that part eligible that you have to do to get the water line in, yeah. um, but not really beyond those, those limits. Yeah. And everybody will have a curb stop now. Yes. When do you anticipate having a, the Paul's point, when do you anticipate having a timeline, um, not only for the entire project, but when you're gonna hit certain sections? Because a lot of us here are business owners on Main Street. Sure. Uh, kind of I mean, huge. generally, Bongo passes in November. Uh, plan is to put this out to bid probably, you know, late January, early February. Open bids in March. Um, got a contractor on board in April. It's probably going to be May time frame before there's, and that's going to be a little function of the weather. He's going to determine when he start. You know, at that point, you'll have a real, you know, detailed schedule of the work and where it's starting and where it's going. Yeah. Are we, are we anticipating multiple year project? Not at this point, no. no. Okay. So it's feasible if it started in May, then it would get done by November or something like that? The only thing I could say maybe is maybe some of the top course of payment or maybe some of the restoration. It may make sense to happen into the following year, but as far as we anticipate all the water line infrastructure you know, to be done in the next calendar year. You said something about uh, average income in the town. And then you also said something about the water rates yep. in the town. How does that affect um, the overall uh, cost of the project? The Do you average that in. Well, absolutely, and that's why you know the town qualifies for the fifty percent additional subsidy, the forty-year term, and the zero percent interest rate. So that's all factored into that calculation. Uh, if they didn't, then it would be more like. Worst case, it would be a 30-year term plus 3% and no subsidies. So because of those factors and the formulas, that qualifies for the state for that, um, that disadvantaged subsidy. One thing I just wanted to expand a little bit on the gentleman's point here is uh, it's great, the project's got to be done, the town's got a sanitary survey, regardless of the funding package, it's got to be done. Um, one thing I don't want to make the pitch tonight to say, it should happen because you've got a great funding package. Um, that's great news, and I think we're excited about that, that there is a great funding package, an opportunity out there, but the project has got to be done irregardless. Um, and it's kind of working out that I think the, pack, the, the funding package and the timing is working very favorably for the town. Obviously, everybody's 
concerned about the impacts of the water customers, and we all should be, rightfully so. Um, so that's a nice side benefit of the whole thing, but we need to remember the project and the work's got to be done. Um, you've got so I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. amplify that because that's very difficult for people to talk about other than me because I am a state of Vermont regulatory person, but essentially non-compliance with the schedule of compliance that's been issued to this town could subject the town. Not only do they not have the benefit of a good funding package, but they could incur financial penalties uh, for not being in compliance and still have to make the improvements in the future. Something <coughs> worth avoiding, I think. Is there any, I mean, business owners on Main Street, there's a few of us sitting here, you know, we're going to be heavily impacted. Okay, we, we just went through a real bad summer of being impacted by other projects that were going on around us that had to be done. I understand this needs to be done because when the water main breaks, I got to boil water. It's not fun. So I'm all for it. I think this is a great idea. Is, has anybody looked into other, other ways of getting funding to help us, you know, as business owners? Because we're going to be heavily impacted. There's going to be no parking. Nobody's going to want to come downtown. How do we, is, is there anything that we can do as maybe as a side group, working with the town, anything that we can kind of work with this and try to make this happen? Has anybody looked into it yet or is anybody looking into it? I haven't, I'm not aware of anything. Okay. I've been through a couple of, you know, big digs, but, and I haven't seen anything for that. It doesn't, you know, I can, I'm certainly willing to look again. Some of the things I know that we have done um, that could be done is obviously A, keeping all the business owners informed, B, is doing some, working with you to do some off-site signing so that you could still have signage in different locations that you know we wouldn't require you to have a zoning permit for to let them know that you're still open for business, to utilize certainly the town's Facebook page um, to do some advertisement and to do uh, maybe, from, you know, if you don't have a front porch account, the town could also echo that as well. Um, but certainly we have had um, off-site signage. I know in some cases businesses have still done okay because they have all the construction people and they're gonna eat somewhere. And so they certainly have picked up people there too. So I personally am not aware of any money, but am happy to, you know, look into it further to see if there's some sort of subsidy and, but definitely keep in mind, you know, off-premise signage, if you want to put up sandwich boards, that sort of thing, within reason, you know, a couple locations, certainly the town would be in favor and certainly encourage that. But I will look and let you know. And I think one thing that's, you know, in favor here is, you know, when you start talking about downtown water lines or sewer lines or utility projects, <clears throat> then that's why I brought that question up earlier was, usually they're multiple year jobs. And so it's not just, you're gonna take a one year, hit in the downtown you take multiple year you know a lot of these are two if not three year jobs so i think you know by looking at this that this would be a 2020 project um, and that the it would limit the impact of the downtown for one year season rather than multiple uh, years um, you know i think is more favorable to us than a normal project um, but I definitely will look into that, Dave, and let you know. I can certainly reach out to other towns. And someone had mentioned that to me that they thought another town had been received some money, but I'm not sure if it was from like the local Waterbury, chamber or where. Waterbury, uh, they did a work group of a railroad bridge that impacted the good section of the town of Waterbury. And I know that those folks got, the businesses that were impacted by that project, Receive some funding now. Whether that was railroad funding, I was just going to say, it was it railroad money? Yeah, <laughs> it could have been Good railroad question. money. I don't know. I don't know. There is actually grant money available through B Trans. There's okay. no federal money um, available. B -trans. But B -trans, but the, it's only available when the Main Street business district is completely shut down. Um, so and they'll I mean, always and there'll be one lane of traffic right. open. For so there'll be one lane. Oh, along with that, obviously, that's not going to happen. Is there a way to incentivize this contract? so that it doesn't drag on forever and ever and ever? Like, can we say, you know, give them miles, give the Well, sometimes there's miles, deadlines, right? If they don't need deadlines or their incentives yeah. that financial penalties yeah. incur. There's a duration and at the end of the day, there's, uh, there are penalties if they go beyond the, uh, beyond the deadline. To David's point, I, I 
know you know this, but I'm going to say it for that camera, that the businesses on this Main Street are extraordinarily fragile right now. So if this drags on, none of us are going to make it. I mean, I'm, you're saying 2020. That's really scary to me, and I know it is yeah. to these guys too. So we need to, this project needs to go and go quickly, yeah. um, especially if you're digging up half the road with all the concrete and everything. It's probably the side that has all the businesses on it, right? I don't know. Do you, can you well, tell us? Well, the water lines are on the other side. I think it's on the bank side. It's on the north side. It's, it's the right bank side. side. The bank north side. side. Yeah, this side. Yeah. So, yeah. Side, right? so yeah. okay. Yeah. 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 okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I would, I guess, We'll, we'll definitely look into uh, yeah, exploring some options on for the yeah. downtown business owners. I mean, I, I think probably the biggest one that comes to my mind is going to be parking. Um, I mean, par parking is pretty limited as it is, and uh, our street is very narrow. So um, I would say once construction activities gets flowing in the downtown, there probably won't be any parking on those streets during construction because you can't. It's not wide enough now to host you know parking as it is. So. I think we'll have to come up with some yeah. That's uh, a couple ways ideas, of figuring out where we can park in the downtown. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we'll see too often. But there's a couple ideas, but I, I mean, I'll do a little research and then talk to the board, but um, to see what else is out there. But and if you can think of anything besides off-premise signage or any of the things that I've already talked about, um, let me know. You know, call me, email me, whatever. If you have some ideas and ways that we could assist in promoting your business during this time. Let me know. I'm certainly yeah. open to if all sorts of suggestions. Happens, you know, that might have is buying the cars. I mean, being a business owner downtown, I say yes. Let's go for it. Let's let's do it. I'd be happy to put information out on my counter because there are a lot of people in town that aren't on internet. You know, there are That's those people great. that you know. So if you can put together something that we could have on our counters, I think Brad would do the same thing. Jesse would do the Absolutely. same thing. Absolutely, and we'll the do that. Thank you. Right. We'd be happy to do we'll that. Do it's going to impact us, but in yeah. the long run, it's going to make things a lot better. Yeah, and we'll mail, yep, we'll do the mailing, and then we'll have some handed out, and, yeah. and certainly I'm sure that um, the Herald is going to do more than one article. We're going to try to keep it out there and then yeah. do that. But again, if you think of any other ideas for businesses to promote your business during construction, let me know. And I think if we put our heads together, we could probably come up with some creative thoughts and do that. Not Chris? You know, we, we might, oh, sorry, Chris, go. Oh, so we might also be able to get a hold of uh, our representatives up in Montpelier mm -hmm. and see if there's some state assistance that's available. I, yeah, I've um, been talking to them. Yeah, we'll talk to the Congress. Yeah, but I think we could do that. Is it Jesse? Yes. It, Chris, Jesse. What's that? Oh, I can't. Oh, I can see it. You're hiding behind this. Yes. Um, I'm just wondering if, if, if any part of this uh, project has um, um, meter installation as part of it, or if that's an idea or on the table. It's not uh, currently, no. And I think. Uh, okay, I'm going to talk about this, or maybe Tim, but uh, currently, no, uh, that's not because of the cost at the 2.8 million. It's it was a uh, cast. Uh, we did find out today um, there may be some requirements coming down the road with drinking water um, that may require some maybe some additional distribution system meters because we currently have a couple um, distribution system meters. Whether it's going to require additional ones at this point, um, we really haven't. Nailed, nailed that down. It's, it's not a state requirement, and everybody's sensitive to the cost, and it's a big, you know, big increase in cost to the <coughs> water customers to add the water meters. Isn't and, and it then, better though for this, the system overall? I mean, no, it's not going to reduce the cost of the water customers because this town still needs to generate enough um, income out of their water rates to cover their fixed costs, which are typically 65 to 70 percent of, of their operating budget so you know I just Fixed just cost for instance being like electricity yeah staff labor benefits um, how much you know, is your electricity I don't know but the fixed costs are typically 65 to 70 percent so right from day one in your budget year before you start producing any water you're going to pay 65 to 75 percent of those fixed costs regardless of how much water you produce and, it, and, and if you look and we've gone down this road before but you know, in a small town like ourselves that has 
a, a small water system. Our fixed costs are higher than probably most most identities, just because we are we have limited users um, on that, and we've gone down this before that our our fixed cost for the system is over seventy five percent. I think it was it seventy six. There's actually something. a chart up high so, chart on the that you all have. The, the challenge right now is <clears throat> the challenge is the variable cost that's left over is such a smaller piece of the pie that by adding in um, the cost for the metering, you'll one, you'll never get the financial benefits to having a meter because of that, because of how small our system is. Um, and also what it would end up doing, the end user would end up being having to be more responsible for their water usage. So what I mean by that is currently we're on an EU system. So um, you know you can go out water your plants or whatever you like to do. If you're on the, if you're on a water meter system, from what we have seen through the data based on how small of a percentage our variable cost is left over is not only would the end user have to pay more money to have a meter on their place, but then it would restrict you on the amount of water you'd have to use. So it'd be kind of almost a double negative based on our current system if we did go with the meters. Well, how do you base the price of the water right now? How do we base the price of the water? Yeah, we're with two bathrooms, two bedrooms, yep. four people in it. Now you take the take the total budget for the year. You divide it by the number of reserved EU connections, and everybody pays an equal piece of the pie. That's really not fair because then somebody who is using very little water pays the same amount as somebody who's using a great deal of water. But to Chris's point, it's there if you want. Well, it's that part. It is. It is. So, so anyways, at this point, we've decided that as a town that it's not financially beneficial um, to go ahead with those. So, again, Tim Raymond, Drinking Water Division. Uh, my concern is, is the town should look seriously at what the cost of some sort of metering approach for the distribution system would entail. My concern on behalf of the community is future regulations are very likely to include a requirement to install distribution system metering. And I'm saying distribution system metering versus service metering. Um, it's up to the community to decide how they want to proceed now. I say now because you're right now you're looking at a drinking water state revolving loan and you've got fairly favorable funding scenario. If this requirement should come into effect within the next five years, you would be expected to then provide some form of distribution system metering, and you're not likely to have as, as good a funding package. So at the very least, I think you should run the costs and present the information so that you can, so you can talk to your user base about that. So what's, what's the difference between your distribution right. metering and residential metering? Well, residential metering is basically you have to be meeting at every single in residential, commercial okay. business. Distribution metering might be uh, some strategically placed meter vaults that meter the total flow of water. Again, meters do nothing more than report where water is going and where it's not going. Mm -hmm. Billing mm -hmm. is a totally separate issue on how you decide to charge for water. And can you use a meter to come up with an approach? Sure, it's a traditional method that's always being used, but you don't necessarily have to use that one. It is important to know where your water is going and where right. it's not going. If you're a water operator and you're trying to uh, sleuth out where all the water is maybe uh, going on meter or, uh, or on uh, non-revenue uh, paying water. And I know Tim will probably attest to this, but you know once we go forward um, with a new um, delivery system here in town, that we probably will see some savings over time based upon not having those leaks anymore, you know, because, you know, we are losing water in different places throughout the town, which means the pumps got to run longer. Every, everything costs a little bit more because we are losing water. And once we have a new distribution system in place, you know, to stop the leaks, we probably will see some savings on that. And again, that's kind of, you know, that's on the variable end of the usage, but we will see some. That savings can then be used when you calculate your next year's budget to not have such an increase. Right, right. Yeah. Um, I can speak to the cost of meters just so people understand. 
state. We're not talking about light power here. We did water meters in a community uh, last year, so got bid prices. About a third of the customers of Bethel, so I just took the numbers from that, extended them out. Uh, this is a very basic uh, meter reading system. It's not anything fancy like the remote. This is still walking up to the house with a gun. Uh, you're looking in the range of six hundred and fifty to seven hundred fifty thousand dollars to have meters uh, installed, and that's all in with all the other costs. Um, we have not gone out to figure out how many meter pits, you know, size larger meters. Um, again, basic reading system. So very very rough numbers. And that's not going to qualify for any more loan subsidy or forgiveness. Um, that's roughly forty dollars a year um, per equivalent unit of a residential customer. So. Um, you're not going to save any money on your water bill because you got a meter. You're going to have to pay on the debt of those meters. Then you've got the additional staff and maintenance costs of taking care of those meters for the next 25 years, 30 years, which have a 25 or 30 year life. So you don't want to borrow money for more than 25 or 30 years because you're going to have to replace the meters. You don't want a 40 year term, you know, on a 30 year old meter. So that's the rough kind of magnitude of cost you're looking at for meters. So I just wanted to go back to the beginning of the meter talk. Um, we talked about the difference between um, distribution um, metering and, you know, residential service metering. Do we, do we, being that it is coming down the pipeline, do we have any of the distribution metering included into this? No. no. Sorry. It isn't currently. The, the problem that we may have, the first big problem is we have two outhouses, two reservoirs. So any of the in-line meters that we put in can only be on the dead end legs that goes out. We have five of them. Uh, anything that happens in town, we're going to be measuring the water when it fills the reservoir, and then we're going to be measuring it when we distribute it. So. I'm, I'm kind of struggling with it a little bit. I understand the concept and I do appreciate it, Tim, I do. But I'm not sure, Wayne and I have talked about it for, and Mike Maynard have talked for a few minutes, but I don't know what the payback is or the cost. And some of these, you know, these streets have 25 houses on it. You know, so we'd, we'd have to be leaking substantially, but we also need to look to the future if it's a regulation coming down. so. <clears throat> this this talk just happened today. Right. This is brand new. I haven't done that in my system in all my years. And that's not the same amount of half of four or five years. Um, so this is not a common thing that other places have been doing up until now. So this is a pending kind of future requirement down, potentially down the road. And there's hydraulic <coughs> logistics with flow going in different directions and getting things sized. It's not quite as simple as just dropping meter structures in around the system. So, so I, I wanted to just uh, revisit the schedule here. Um, so right now we have the, the 5th, 5th of November, just kind of working back. Um, so the 5th of November is our bond vote uh, time, which uh, makes the 28th of October right now our public informational um, night. Yep. And And the select board here, to be able to adhere to that, the 23rd, you would have to sign the bond documents. The to, bond to documents need to be signed at least 30 days prior to the vote. So okay. if you didn't do it on the 23rd, you could do it at a special meeting. Right. That's your option. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the okay. public hearing has to be within 10 days of the bond vote. The bond documents signed is the day prior. Okay. So in, in terms of the board here, the decision for the board would have to be made at the next meeting. Um, a special meeting. Yeah. Board. And I know we had talked about um, potentially putting another meeting in there for the 16th, um, if we wanted that, um, depending on you know questions from um, from the public. And um, you know, at this time, how how does the board feel about? Um, Either staying with the 23rd to make uh, to sign the documents, or or does the board feel like we need need another session um, to talk more about this, or are there any questions that haven't been answered tonight that that we need answered to make 
the decision? Well, we would say some of it is, of course, just so you know, if you haven't seen one before, the wording of the bond vote is interesting because it's, it stopped me if I'm wrong, it's been a couple of years, but the wording is, it's pretty wordy because it does say that you go out to vote, you're saying for the total 2.8, right. but you do put in additional language to say that may be reduced by, you know, um, subject to reduction, reduction of reduction rates reduction based on different grants. So yeah. you're still going and all the documents are based on the 2.8 mm -hmm. and then and it's just acknowledging and educating the voters that well, we we have to say for the whole project because it's forgiveness that that actually will be reduced when it comes down to payments and and I'm not sure is there one year on warranty like is there before the payments start like maybe yeah, that's there just is. so one time. year from the so your first loan payment wouldn't be due until um, and this is a recent change uh, it's basically the end of 2021. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's driven a little bit when substantial completion, but assuming it's it's the end of next year. Okay. So, um, so just so you know, when you read the bond, you know the, the wording of the bond vote itself, it's it's a big question, and that's kind of just so we're all clear that that's how it's written out. But um, and certainly the bond documents go out before the bond before the bid before we even have the bond vote. So the signing of the of the bid documents, the bond documents, has to take place. <coughs> Regardless of whether or not the bond vote passes, passes or fails. yes, yep. So keeping it the twenty third seems to make sense. Mm -hmm. I would think. Right. Okay. Now it's just whether or not we want to do another meeting. Well, I think at, the, at this point it would be you know if if I mean, that has if to happen have anyway. Questions that are answered, then you know probably probably tonight is probably the the best night to get that information. Or at least present that question so that we can get the proper um, information back for the 16th if we chose to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, I would I would think at this point, I mean, it's um, to move forward, which you know we need to in one way or another. Um, yeah. You know that we would be prepared on the 23rd as a select board to sign the bid document or the bid bond. The bond document. The bond documents. And I think that and Wayne then is going to move forward with the bond vote. And you're going to be here on the 23rd, right? Uh, I can. It's yeah. basically just the attorneys and bond counsel's going to prepare the documents. Yeah. We'll talk about that. So we'll sign. So it's not a big deal. But I, if you had questions before that, we could certainly, I could collect them and get them to Wayne. And if Wayne couldn't be here, he could answer them via email. And I could at least distribute those to you on the 23rd if you had questions between now and then. If you didn't want to have an additional meeting on the 16th, you could kind of collect your questions. and. Well, I think that the meeting on the 16th was for informational purposes for you know, the public to come in with more questions. So there was, the more meetings we have, the better. You know, get well, I think, I think my concern at the point would be, well, I, I mean, I think I would be ready to move forward at our next meeting with, with signing. Um, I guess my concern would become more on the uh, in, uh, informative end of things and making sure that I know we have to have a you know public informational meeting within 10 days of the bond vote but I'm thinking that we may want to look at two of those okay. and that's and fine maybe try to figure out how how best we can reach a majority of, of the voters to inform them of you know yeah, absolutely some people are going to see 2.8 when it really might only be mm -hmm. 800,000 that they get to come up with, you know, so we gotta. It would get seem that if you're gonna add an extra meeting, you might wanna add it in October because yeah. then we'd have yeah. more information right. and, and, and certainly have a better handle on things. So maybe you don't do the 60 because you obviously have a lot of information and right. the idea is, but That's then if we, we could always do an added in one. In I'm October. thinking an added one in October. Yeah. So my two slides in there. Um, <laughs> Um, typically, it's perfect to find a second meeting, but if you do, you want to probably do it about a week before the, you know, the bond period is scheduled. You know, you're six or seven weeks out, mm -hmm. and you know, people aren't really in tune thinking about it too much. Tonight was great just to give people an overview, um, but it's, I, I would recommend you probably do that about mid-October, about a week before the other one. Um, yep. That's where people are going to start thinking about it. You can get them ready kind of for the vote. Um, and if you do that first one, you can get an idea of what the questions are. Um, come back with the second one if we're prepared to maybe customize that or 
respond to people's concerns and all that, but getting them closer to the vote, I think, is more effective. So typically, did, yeah. So doing one October, doing it the 15th, you already had on the agenda, you could do one the 22nd, and then again the 28th. That well, I was, so the bond vote is for the 5th, right? Which is yes. the Tuesday. Right, but you have so, to, he's saying a week before your scheduled information, all right, which is the 28th. Yeah, yeah so I would say, uh, my I guess what I was looking I at is, you know, we have the 28th, which is covers the 10 day. You know, yes. But I was thinking the 28th, and then you have one the night before. Oh, you mean the night before the bond vote? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you meant, I thought Wayne was saying five days before the 28th, like yeah. doing it earlier um, in October. I would, I would probably recommend you have one in the middle of October. I think yeah. middle of October. more effective just because you're starting to put the flyers out, you're getting information out to people. Um, the problem is if you do, you know, sometimes you have to do one the night before the bond vote, but if you've got questions or people have concerns, mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to address them after the fact. I mean, they walk out of there, That's you a know, good they're point. kind of making their mind up. I mean, totally up to you, but I think more commonly if we're doing a second one, like we're probably doing one. Because uh, we had it. You know, you got one at 28. You're doing it early that week of the 21st, mm -hmm. maybe, you know, the 21st of the second, and then doing the other one on, on October 28th. So. Okay. That's a good idea. I would, I would ask that you think about getting the literature out to the public a little earlier then so that people have time to look at it and digest it and have questions. But I think we had talked about, well, I had October 17th for some reason, but around that, we, we had talked about that, so we maybe shoot for the 15th or something, and then they're mailed and people have them, and we could, and then in that mailing, you would say, we're going to have an informational on the whatever, 21st, 22nd, and the 28th, and so people realize they have boom, boom, and maybe we have a page on our website dedicated to it, so people that are perhaps, you know, really attend those could find on the website all the information with them. I mean, in your in your history of doing these, is there is there a better day of the week? Is it? Not I really. mean, if no. you did a weekend yeah. versus a weekday, I, is would, there... I would recommend a weekend. I mean, most typically, they're probably Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday night. So, you know, people are busy. People have kids in school, and um, I don't know if one night's the better, but typically we would see them space because you're not gonna people aren't gonna really start paying attention or informing a decision on questions and probably. You know, until two or three weeks out, which is really the middle of October. Um, and the challenge you're going to have with a November vote, where there's not an election, is getting people, frankly, getting people out to vote. Right. That's the most important thing, regardless of what their position is, is getting people to vote. Um, mm -hmm. That's the most important thing because there's not anything else on the ballot. Right. Uh, and as you recall, with this, mm -hmm. the entire town votes, but at this point in time, you know, the cost of the project is on the water customers. Um, so getting people out to vote is important, as, especially for this November election. Yeah. That's one of the reasons we're doing the 5th is because people, there are elections other places on the 5th, so people right. get thinking about voting, and so it obviously makes sense. So how does it, when did it come that it would be just the water users who were gonna be bearing the, the cost? Because I think we talked about maybe doing a percentage Kind of a thing, possibly with all the taxpayers. We had, and then when, and it was something that Tim and I had talked about after the meeting was we kind of were looking at the number. Obviously, that it's tricky, and and we talked about that. I think Chris had even said, you know, it's a concern when you're trying to spread the payment out onto the users as well as the taxpayers because it could make the the bond a lot more difficult to pass. But once we saw the number over 40 years in the bond payment, it wasn't, you know, you're talking maybe, what was it, less than 20 bucks a year. Yeah. Um, and, and it was and that, $4 a quarter or something. $4 a quarter no, or something. $4 a quarter, $4 a month. $4 a month, and so, um, yeah, so that we were looking at, and then we still, you know, we're still looking at, and so that we were looking at, and then we still, you know, fingers crossed, have the ability to even reduce that further, possibly by the galvanized money. So it didn't seem like it was necessary to open up that can of worms. Um, yeah, because we've had, you know, continuing increases to the water users exactly. over the past year. Yep. That's why I, I asked you to come up with that report. Yep. And so that's why we looked at that, because it is, it's obviously something you want done, you need done. And if the cost had been substantial, then we were certainly prepared to crunch numbers and come up with some options to how to divvy it up. But, um, so that's how we kind of had come up with this. And the whole town has to vote because the whole, um, 
because the whole, it's the faith and credit of the town that's applying for the bond. That's why everybody votes, but that's. But that was a discussion that Tim and I had, and certainly um, because the number just looked so good. It, you know, it's, it's harder, it's a big rock to push uphill when you're trying to push that onto the taxpayers as well. Will there be any language in the actual, um, you know, what, what voters are voting on that is explicit about the fact that the burden will be only on the water users and not on the taxpayers? That'll be in the information, but it's not in the question. No, it's not on the bond document specifically. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be amount because the town is authorizing the total amount. Um, it is definitely on all the information flyers. Um, Sometimes we'll put it in bold letters, but just very clearly anything that goes out, um, just can be transparent. People kind of understand who's paying and who's not. Right. Any further questions or anything from the board? Right. Okay, well, we thank you for coming today. Just to be clear, this, as Tim is saying, is they, this wouldn't qualify as part of the funding for the water. We would have to put that in, but still, the ground is open and, you know, all, everything else has already happened on the, the mobilization and the whole thing. So, and we don't have, I don't remember, I'm sorry, an idea of a rough estimate. Well, that's why I asked Wayne and Mike if they would just stay for a couple of minutes. Just if you guys have some questions, you could bounce them off. How does it end up, if the town did this additional work, how does it end up affecting the contractor that's doing the water mains at their schedule? Well, so we haven't necessarily got into the details of it yet. Um, 
there's a couple ways you could do it. Um, it obviously wouldn't be eligible for the state funding, but you could put it into the bid and it could just be identified as a non-eligible cost with its own bid items and units. That's probably the cleanest way. Um, I can't see this works very well if it's uh, you know, done separately, like that kind of stuff, because as, as Tim said, they got the street dug up and you know, they need to do the paving restoration, all that kind of stuff. So that's probably the cleanest way. We haven't talked about it too much, but have separate bid items, not eligible. So you guys know what the cost is and you know, kind of make a decision on that moving forward. So you'd basically just be a diff different bucket of money um, out of the whole thing, so. Right, but for re I guess in terms of the repaving piece, yep. that would be the yep. contractor for the, the main project. Yep. Are they then affected if additional work is being done? Does their schedule get pushed back? Yeah, I mean, okay. could, we yeah. would have to potentially give them some additional time in the contract with that we're talking about using the same contractor to do yes, both. It's still the same. Okay. Yeah. Maybe one layer of laptop, and we've got to put it down there. <laughs> right. We've got a crown yeah, So you, you bid them separately. But it'd be the well, same. Con it, it, well, she's, I think, yes, it would be whoever's installing the water would also install, install these. Right. But yeah. separating the cost out so you can see who's possible. It would be. Those okay. yeah. and, and Wayne and Michael can do estimates on them. I think. I think there's one thing we have to be careful of, something like that, but um, is, <laughs> I mean, knowing where all these roads are at, <clears throat> that the fix isn't quite as simple as just putting storm drains in. Cause, no, not because not these, these roads are very challenged to begin with. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, <clears throat> you know, putting storm drains in is one thing, but it's going to be a lot more cost associated with this project than just those structures themselves. Because, you know, these, these roads here either either right now the roads, you know, pitch to the opposite side of the storm drain or, you know, there, there's not a, 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 a ditch to get to the storm drain. They actually lay out pretty decent if you, or like, you know, if you go up on Some of these are pretty challenging to get water to them now. Or yeah, wood. pushing, like pushing drive ahead of blacktop uh, ditch that went down the side of it. <laughs> That's why it's eaten out the blacktop <laughs> and disappeared. And if you have a catch basin at the top of the corner, and really, it should be blacktop uh, drainage again. That's uh, the one that Dave Sanborn had brought to our attention last absolutely. time, and I'd given it yeah, to yeah. Alan to go take a look at. And, yeah. and some of these are existing structures. Yeah. Too. There, there, are, there are a few that are in the streets. Yeah. Um, the one on Pushing Drive is all the way to the up behind the old Randolph National. Yeah. And then you've got one part way up Livery Stable. Uh, Avon is already, it's already pitched, so you could just do a cross link across the street to grab it uh, from the left and swing it over to the right. So it's not a done deal, but it's just definitely something to think about because it makes right. sense. And well, if we don't, we don't. <laughs> yeah, and if you don't, and you look like idiots later if we cut up brand new pavement. So I like the idea of, of you know, which is something that Chris has certainly been talking about, which is being more proactive than reactive. And I certainly appreciate um, when Tim mentioned it. I was like, oh my God, of course, you know, this, we got to look at this and consider this. Well, can we get an estimate on what we think? Well, we had a little way early. I just I figured if I threw it out there so you guys could talk about it and think about it. <clears throat> and, I, you know, I put the pictures and stuff so you go left on your own or whatever. And That's great. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I have no skin in it. <laughs> yeah. It seems like it makes sense. I mean, a majority of these roads look like they're, um, they've seen the end of their life anyway. So they're, it's time for them to be and we're rehabilitated in one form yeah. and might as well yeah. put the drainage structures in at the same time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there is storm drains that run right along Main Street uh, in the, the necessary places to catch it. Yeah, and we're already digging these up for the water lines anyway, so, you know, you already have the road cut up. It makes sense to get the most bang for your buck while you're in there, but. Mm -hmm. Can you do it down the road later? Oh, God, yeah. I mean, I would say just, uh, you know, I guess my opinion would be to, to you know, figure out what the estimate would be, yeah. and then, you know, yeah. I guess we can, before we actually put it out to bid, you know, right. have a decision on, you know, maybe this is a, a $100,000 project, and, it gets added into, yep, into that. Um, so are you and, essentially, or do you want to take? Do you need to take it to a vote? Do you <coughs> among the board, or are you 
was just looking for Wayne to do a cost estimate. I got a cost estimate. That's all. Got some ideas of the numbers. Yeah. I mean, I, think I, think we're I mean, I think as long as it's reasonable. I mean, yeah. and, and yeah. obviously we have a couple other areas that have been identified that you know right now might be a little higher priority. Oh, for I money. understand that. Yeah. But being that we're going to have the street dug up anyways, and it might make sense to invest that. And, um, and you've also got a year, so you've got another budget cycle you can plan to, to uh, pay on or what after right. what one of the next year. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of things that kind of makes it enticing. I think, I think one, it would be, uh, <clears throat> we, we will be starting our budgeting like soon next mm -hmm. time. Um, so it's, it's starting right now. So I think it would be helpful to have a cost estimate before, you know, before the end of December. Because then we could potentially put it into um, our next budget. Yeah. Um, I guess that would be the deadline. Would be the end of. Does December. that work for you, Wayne? Yeah, we probably need a decision even before that, though, yeah. because we're going to want to, you know, we're going to have stuff pretty well wrapped up before that. Okay. Uh, so as soon as you get an estimate, just yeah. email it to me, and I'll put it on the next agenda yeah, and so let them know. Absolutely. As soon as you get the number, we'll do it. But I was just really happy because, um, you know, the select board and, and Chris, you know, certainly been talking about being more forward thinkers and more proactive. And so when Tim came to me, you know, on this, I thought it was great. There's, there's some, who's somebody who's looking at the big picture. And so I, I think it's great. And, and this was so happy that you thought of it. Thank you. I mean, I think I would be a little more hesitant if all these roads were like just freshly paved and you're like, oh boy, like we just, but it's did these roads, roads, but you're looking at them, they're all like potholed and... And we're going to rip them up in it. Yeah, it so it looks like they kind of need time. Yeah. yeah, They're in pretty bad shape. Because yeah. so, all the water lines going up through there anyway, so... Yep. So when you do the cost estimate, obviously on some of these, you know, on these we're doing a portion of work underneath the, the water system. But so I'm assuming that the cost estimate that you would give us would be anything outside the scope of that work. Yeah. And you know, and I would say on some of these because they are they're small roads, yeah. they're not very lengthy that we may want to just look at to see it means it's open, you know, do we you know pave the whole road or whatever, you know, not just I, I think it in or well, most of them are paved or with and anyway. Yeah. Well, right. is not to get ahead of a little bit, but there is a little flexibility to take, instead of going two depths of pavement, um, to kind of use the same value uh, and maybe get some overlay work out of it too. So that's something we can just, when we right. kind of see what the disturbance of both those utilities are, um, there is some flexibility there, Chris, you know, with the state and what they'll apply for that. And, 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 and there's two of these roads that every time it rains that we get complaints of Huge. material discharging, yeah. not water, but material, material that flows down the street. So yeah. mm -hmm. you know, they have been identified as problem areas. So I guess they, I mean, can't, I mean, can't hurt to do an estimate and then we yeah, can see how that right. might, may or may not fit into the budget. Yeah, so, sure. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, any further discussion on the extra stormwater drainage? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And we have a little FEMA project update. Rachel. Oh, no, uh, sorry. Well, Rachel won't be here this evening, so. They, their guests are not doing this activity, it said in the email that Chris and I received. I'm They'd sorry. ask to postpone it for now. That's oh. all I know. Sorry about that. I had already crossed it off after I heard about it. Thank you. Thank you, Queen. Yeah, Thanks, Mike. Yeah. So it's postponed until the end of the day. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure. I got. I thought the email said they weren't going to do the activity. Yeah, it sounded like oh, they were okay. going to cancel it, but. Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to swear to that. I'd have to reread the email at least some on it, but I feel like that's the takeaway from that. Huh? The <laughs> I know, that's why, yeah, so it must be they decided not to. Yeah, you're right, good point. So that I must be right in my takeaway that they're not going to do the event. So, uh, FEMA update. So the, um, the Lilyville-Campbell-Whittier um, piece 
the, the contract, it says it's completed. We, we do have um, one uh, culvert that we're going to be installing. Mm -hmm. So the, the culvert at the end of Camp Bell, um, Camp Brook intersection area, uh, that culvert had washed out during the spring flood event. And a, another culvert was put in in more of a temporary fashion than a permanent fashion. So, um, so we've been trying to figure out if we want, what we want to do permanently there. And what we've decided to do is um, to put another permanent culvert in there. And at the same time, this should alleviate um, the issues that we have there with the site um, that we talked about last meeting. Um, so the contractor is gonna, is gonna remove and reset the existing culvert deeper because um, it at this point only has just a couple of inches of cover on top of it. And um, the existing culvert will, will take care of any of the spring water um, runoff. And then the storm water runoff will be caught through the uh, new culvert. So um, we'll work on that here over the next couple weeks and then that contract will be done. So uh, based on you know that, the contract will be completed. The um, southwest quadrant pieces, which is um, uh, Frank and Thayer, uh, Dunham, um, those areas, uh, we had just finished that up last week. Uh, there might be some minor, some, some minor touch-up work to do on those roads, but um, as far as the contractor, we've completed work there. The east quadrant, which is the Sanders, uh, Arnold, Christian Hill, North Main Street. So that contract's ongoing. Mo's been heading that one up. Um, and I would say they probably have another week left. <coughs> uh, all he's got left is uh, yeah. Finney Bridge and, and uh, Program Dock. Yeah, so that. He's 90% done. So, you know, within the week, that should close up on, on that job. Mm. Northwest Quadrant, which is the Gilead sections, um, you know, Byam, Gilead, a little bit on Macintosh. That is on its way, I would say it's probably, you know, almost 50% of the way there. So, um, the, um, we shouldn't have any issues with, um, you know, initially we had that scheduled to be done by the 15th of September. Um, it's probably going to be more like a, a week later than that, but we've also added uh, other responsibilities to that contractor, so we're not going to hold them um, responsible to going over the contract, but it should get done in a reasonable time. The Camp Brook Road pave in will start tomorrow, so um, so the next three, four days, seek alternate route, um, even though. You should have been already, but uh, we all know there's a lot of people traveling back and forth that mountain that don't live up there, right, Doug? Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know too many people that own semi trailers that live up there, do you? But, <laughs> but we see them go by here all, all the time. So, so. they're going to be posting signs down at the bottom again. And there are paving. currently signs there. Yeah. And I know I mean about paving, not going paving or anything uh, like that. Well, you have um, so. You'll continue to have the message boards that says, um, you know, it's camp closed. closed. Yeah. Um, you'll have the delineation at the bottom of the hill continuing to say that's closed. Um, inside the work zone packages will be signed, um, so you'll know and that. And flaggers. So um, what you will see is that, you know, it will, um, you know, three or four days in, it, throughout the project, you know, you, you will, you know, there might be some areas that will be delineated off, not to drive in overnight type deal. Um, but once we get, once the contractor's in sections, it should get done within a 48 hour period. So um, if not, you can call Mo because he had, he's heading that one up. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so it, it should go rather, rather quickly there. Um, and then there's been some incidental work going on on that road that I'd say at this point, majority of that has been completed by it is done there's some permanent work that's going to have to go back out on camp brook which is rip wrapping that huge culvert near jim ford's 
um, and possibly over the bank near some uh, guardrail. That bank there may be eroded some, so that may qualify for some permanent work, um, which would be the town would be on the hook for 10% of that. Uh, certainly the riprap needs to take place uh, near the big culvert. That would need to be redone. Um, I have spoken with and emailed Chris Bump because he and I went up and looked at those areas about what we need to do to start that process because you don't want to do it too far away from your event or um, Federal Highway may not pay for it. So um, The other bids there are uh, the Bethel Mills Pump Station. I think that's maybe completed. If not, it's definitely wrapping up, but I think it might be done. I forgot to double check with Tim Mills today. Uh, Geico, the road to the reservoir is um that will be done you know a couple three weeks i think so that rounds out all the oh no it doesn't the uh the p-vine the slide and the culvert on p-vine the engineering i put those bids are out um and i can't i want to say they're due this friday but i want to swear to it on my calendar in front of me but those two are out as well uh actually maybe it says right here so those are out to bid as well. I think that maybe rounds up all of our all of our stuff that's out. Um, and even though the projects. even though the contractors that um, were contracted to do the individual FEMA jobs may be wrapping up, doesn't necessarily mean there won't be any activity going on those roads. Right. We're continuing to do um, you know punch list type activities with with their town highway department on on other things that may not have been covered under FEMA, so, yep. Did anybody like to build two jobs that were done last week on Camberg Road? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Did anybody like to do jobs that were done last week on Camberg Road? Two jobs done last week on Camberg Road? Yeah. Uh, the, stone, stone, the stone the job below Doug Lana's house? The culvert. Or Doug, or not Doug. Yo, Russo's house? Are you talking about the culvert? There the stonework around it? Done, and the, um, up by the a little bit further up where the guardrails so the one the job that was done below joe russo's house that culvert they might look at that i haven't been out yet no somebody out him okay the stone's higher than the road and there's no ditch on the lower side of it it's level with the road okay there's I don't know, my opinion yeah no we'll go i'll take a peek at it so when Pike, Wednesday. when they come in and pave on Cambrook Road, are they going to fix any of the ditching that was repaired during the? So it's just box cut and pave. Yep, box and cut. And then that's on the yep. town to fix. And to uh, fix the there'll board. be some minor shoulder um, aggregate stuff, but yeah. as far as and that's why I said there's probably going to be a little bit more ongoing there because you know once the once the um, pavement's put in place, there's going to be some areas that probably going to have to go in there and some minor ditching is going to have to, to tie things mm -hmm. together. Um, I did uh, take Chris Bump the, through there last week or the week before. It all kind of runs together right now. And had him look at some stuff to see about maybe doing some additional ditching to do some additional work. And he, you know, wasn't. I just want to fill in some of those big blocks. It's like the roads and the ditch are level. I just assumed that'd be one project to pave and ditch or something. But yeah. Right. They, I tried to get some additional ditching work done through that, but they were saying wasn't as part of the April. They were saying it was maintenance that needed to be done, so I couldn't, you know, so I'm gonna end up, I think we're gonna end up doing, having to do some ditching with the road up there. But I think They're we'll do, and, and Camp Brook Road will be, you know, somewhat similar like the other contracts that we have out there that even after the contractor's gone, there's probably gonna be some work that's gonna go on out there. Um, to make the FEMA work tie into the existing conditions out there, so. And we'll, we'll have to right. go out and take a look at the. Because he's right, it needs to be ditched. I mean, yeah. I, I went up through there and, and stopped and walked parts of it and, and, you know, and Ryan's right, it needs to be ditched. And well, some of it was repairs. flood. Some of it was, I'm sorry, some of it was. Some of it was from the repairs during the flood, you know, they just filled in. They just filled them in. And so the ditch was filled in too. So I'd think mm -hmm. what it should have been part well, of the project. Yeah. So we'll have to walk it when Pike is done and then send the road crew up there to do some, you know, to add that. We haven't, the only thing they had done was refilled holes, certainly, and, you know, potholes. They hadn't done much on Gambrook. They were focused elsewhere. But you're right, there's definitely. But I'll go out and look at the culvert 
Um, I'll be back in town by the so I'll go. Thank you. I'll take a look. <clears throat> no, it's a good one. Any questions in regards to the theme of the work? It's coming along. Uh, let's see. And then we had the Canela Canela Bridge. So, um, as we had talked about <clears throat> um, two meetings ago about putting the, um, the temporary Pinello Bridge back out for bid. Um, did you have any updates to the, I did the to move forward? I have the bidder stand as it is, that um, North Road property is the low bidder and they're gonna move forward with the contract. Um, and also below that is the um, <clears throat> contract for us, for you to sign um, for the temporary rental agreement. And in that temporary rental agreement, Chris it states that um, the municipality acknowledges the need to return the temporary bridge to the state as soon as possible, and to that end agrees to expedite reconstruction or replacement of the existing bridge. That's pretty open-ended. It doesn't give you a specific yeah. time frame. So uh, North Road Properties, which is Dylan McCullough, is the low bidder on Vanilla Bridge. And, and I did have a conversation with him um, earlier. Uh, today to make sure that you know he was all set to move forward with the project. I didn't think they did that type of. Thing. Um, they were also had worked with um, another bridge inst installer to um, you know talk through the bid and some assistance putting the bridge together. So they were kind of working with another, which was exactly what St. Ange was working with W. B. Rogers, and so some of these were working with local contractors. So. Um, so that's the. So I'll, I'll just read off the the uh, bid results, and then we can talk about an award. Um, so um, yeah, North Road Properties, um, and their bid amount was a uh, hundred and sixty-six thousand four hundred dollars. And next bidder was Cold River Bridges. And their uh, bid amount was $181,555. Third bidder was A.L. St. Ange. And their bid amount was $191,800. Uh, we had Daniel's Construction. Hundred and ninety seven thousand four hundred dollars. Yep. And the last one was Chesterfield Associates, and they were at three hundred forty six thousand dollars even. So those are the ones that bid three thirty one last time. <clears throat> right. So I would, <clears throat> the FEMA projects are tricky because um, the way in which you should award the FEMA jobs is by low bidder. Um, and that's the way that we've awarded all the contracts to date. Um, I guess I have a little bit of concern. Um, so I have a little bit of concern. I mean, I want to use the local people whenever we can. Um, However, you know, having someone get into um, constructing a bridge that has no experience doing it kind of concerns me a little bit considering that there are two well-qualified bridge contractors that, you know, are another fifteen dollars to $25,000, you know, mm -hmm. off, which really isn't a whole lot of money when you're talking. You know, for us, town-wise, is maybe another twenty-five hundred dollars that done. So, right. um, <clears throat> so I guess it, you know, it's a little bit of a tough. You know, I, I did ask him, and he'd spoken to Winterset. So I do. My he was working 
I wasn't sure if Winterset was going to bid. They were certainly received the packages and stuff to bid, and he had, you know, has a connection with someone at Winterset. So my impression is that he's going to have assistance from Winterset, who is building a bridge currently in Pittsfield, um, to assemble the bridge. And I spoke with him, and he said yes, that he was good with the number, and you know, I tried to compare the two bids between Colt River and North Road and it's hard. Everybody bids it differently. So where one is higher, one is lower, there was no it wasn't comparing apples to apples, so it's difficult. But I mean if obviously if he goes over, you know, this is it. I mean it's not like we're gonna add to that well, contract. You've, you've if he goes group, over, he loses. You've got a group there that are pretty much, you know, in the same ballpark. Yep. And I mean I don't I don't know everything about his business, but I don't have the feeling that he has the necessary expertise or experience mm -hmm. or equipment for that matter. I, I'm just not sure through FEMA if we if you can reject a bid on on that. I mean, it's a low bid or he's significantly lower. I I don't know. I can certainly speak with someone. Um, so what's, what is what is entailed in this project? What's entailed is abutments, right, and then slide the bridge across. Right. I mean, because what they're doing is they're removing the abutment that's closest to the river, closest to the river, geez, in the river, it's closest to the road. Excuse me. Then removing the deck. So that's all excavation work. They're just breaking it up and taking it out, right? Then they obviously yes, they're building the um, the the drives. The uh, what's the word I want? You know, up to the bridge. Approach. Approach. approach, thank you. So the approach is to the bridge. They are putting concrete block, which they're setting in the river um, to be the middle of the bridge. And obviously you have someone here that's going to be there from the state, the technical gentleman will be gates will be there. And then they're putting the bridge together. And um, and he's obviously there to oversee that. And that's what's going to span the 100 foot. So the Bailey Bridge, right? Yeah, or maybe bridge or Bailey Bridge or whatever the prop storm is so yes a lot of the contract is excavation you said uh, they signed a work performance bond anyways right anybody doing these projects they just well they, no they signed a bid bond so you know what that means you know is if if we went ahead tonight and and uh, awarded you know, to a certain contractor, and then they, after the award, uh, you know, let's say they, they sign all the documents, and then after that, they get out there on day one and say, oh, we can't do this, and we're out of here. Then then the town would, would be allowed to cash in on the, the bond, or in this case, the check. Um, so, however, it's such a small amount of money, you know, in this case, it's seven or eight thousand dollars that the town would keep but then it pushes everything out you know right. i mean who you know that you know where the leaves are turning and you know falling out of the tree already so I, I don't know i think it's just challenging i don't know how the fema process well i think typically you're supposed to take the low bid mm -hmm. um i don't know if you have to but typically that's the process and i could have a conversation um, with them what you could do is you could you could make a motion to authorize me to award the bid to either, it's either gonna be North Road or Cold River, or Cold, Cold River, yeah, River, that was Cold Hollow, Cold River, and um, then we could go, you could just authorize me to do that, I can have a conversation with, with certainly the FEMA to find out what the avenues here, I, Dylan was here, and now he's not, I wish he was here, if I'd known you were gonna have this discussion, I would've asked him to stay. Um, I mean, I think, you know, we we want to award to the you know of course well one to to low bid because it's a low bid process but mm -hmm. also to you know a local company because that keeps money in this area but you know we're not talking about ditching or grading some roads we're talking about putting in a yep. temporary structure so you know I get I just had a little bit of heartburn trying to you know I just see this thing you know not happening the way we want it and then. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. 
I mean, so that's your option, I think, is you could make the motion to authorize me to award the bid to one of the two lowest bidders. I can call, talk to FEMA, talk to um, state tomorrow and um, sort it out. Tomorrow or Wednesday. Tomorrow I'll be at a local votes class. So tomorrow afternoon or Wednesday I could make, I could do some emails and, and try to get some answers here. So what, what's our, what happens if we award to a little bidder and it turns out to not be what it needs to be? Meaning that they can't complete the project? Or can't complete it satisfactorily. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, you know, it's going to be tough because you're going to have to bring somebody in when, if they leave the project, then you're, somebody's coming in and you have the balance of whatever you haven't paid out to try to get someone else to finish the project. But, I mean. It would end up being a lot more expensive because you're going to have that with mobilize anybody. somebody else in yeah. to do it. And you could have had that with any other project that you've right. awarded so yeah. far. Right. No, I mean, you, you run that risk on anything that you yeah. do. Right. Um, but the other companies, I mean, obviously they have experience, you know, doing, doing these reviews. Right. Um, so. But if he's bringing on people from a, an experienced bridge company to actually do the that's, installation, that's, I don't know, that's a different story. That's his, you know, he can do that. Right, and then maybe that them. would give you more comfort, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm just, I don't know. I'm a little do weird. you have any experience putting these bridges in? We put the one in by Where's that? We put the one. We put one in on the back road in Stockbridge. How how large of one was that? It wasn't as long as this one. About the same size? Oh, not it as long. It wasn't as long, no. What what kind of equipment do you use to put install that? They're one? gonna need more than he has. I mean, you I was get a crane, especially that's that three hundred feet long. Yeah. It's a hundred. 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 Hundred foot. You're gonna get cranes to pull it across. Yeah. But they were saying, and that actually in the discussion of this with engineers, they weren't saying that because I know yeah. some people didn't want to bid on it because they were concerned about the power lines. And one of them was saying, well, we can't put a crane in here. And somebody else said, well, you don't need it because you could put something, another piece of equipment on the other side to pull it across. Because yeah. you could slide it in place. Know. Yeah, the new slide. Yeah. I don't know. I don't have any experience. That Mill River did a bridge up in Granville for the state. They did a really nice job. I mean, and, and um, is it Cold River? I want to keep saying Cold Hollow. Cold River obviously Cold River. did the high bridge, they right? They did the Lilliesville. Yeah, and, and um, you know, obviously, nice Way person. Long. It's Jimmy Holler, and he'd called and um, you know offered some assistance earlier on. But I can talk to. Let me talk to some people tomorrow. I just think since you don't know what you want to do, you could make that motion, and uh, I can sort it out tomorrow and Wednesday and make an award. By the end of the week. I mean, I hate to put a floating motion out there of one or the other, yeah. you know. I'd rather make a decision if we pick one or the other. Yeah, but I'm not sure, since we don't know the FEMA rules right now, I'm not sure you're in a position to make that motion. Well, we I can mean, make it contingent upon, you know. If you make authorization of the bid to North Road Properties contingent on the dual approval of whatever, FEMA and the state, then obviously if they say no, it would automatically go to the next bidder. So you wouldn't have to put an either or out there. You could just put some caveats on the award. Who is North Road Properties? Dylan, Dylan McCullough. Dylan McCullough. I mean, I just, I don't know, I'm just a little worried on the bridge and the things. Okay, then why don't you make a motion that's um, contingent on whatever. Contingent on state and FEMA approval, and we can make then I can make the award because obviously if they say no, it automatically goes to the next person. What do you mean if they no, say no? No, it wouldn't go that way. Yeah. It's going to go to the next low bidder. So if they say no, they're not comfortable. It's automatically going to I'm automatically going to award to the next person, which is the next low bidder, which is Cold River. I'm saying is if the state if he withdraws his bid, you mean? No, I'm saying if the state if the state says maybe I worded that incorrectly. If, if the state exactly. and FEMA says that they they agree with you that they're not comfortable and they want us to move to the next bidder. But do you, I don't think the state's going to weigh in on that. Right? 
I'm going to ask the opinion of the state and see what they say. And then I'm, well, I can ask, let me just ask and see what they say. And then, but I can, but I, mean, I have to find out from FEMA what the rule is. If anything, I would be more comfortable with uh, awarding it, you know, to Cold River Bridges. Um, contingent upon FEMA allowing us to award it to the second little bidder. You know, I guess that that would be the way I would look at it. But I mean, and again, I you know, I think we all like Dylan, and we'd rather have the local contractor do work around here. But I just, I mean, he hasn't done one of these. You know, in some cases, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but in some cases, when you're bidding out these bridges, it'll say in there that you know you have to be qualified or so many years of experience or you know. To, right. do, to do certain things like that. And I just, Which it didn't say in our... I mean, mm -hmm. we sat there at the bid opening and there was one bidder that showed up and was $47,000. And obviously, he didn't really look at it. Yeah. <laughs> and then he ended up costing his bid, you know, yeah. pulling his bid back. So, I mean, mm -hmm. um, it's one thing to bid something. It's another to actually have done the work and, you know, have some experience in it. Um, I mean, I just think it's... For the difference in the cost. For everything that we've been through with this this bridge and you know we're we're behind obviously the time frame of getting this in and i think i think unfortunately in this case that we'd be taking a higher risk by by using a contractor that doesn't have the experience um, when we have two other contractors that are second and third that do have a lot of experience um, i guess i guess i would entertain a motion to to accept Cold River Bridges uh, one hundred eighty one thousand five hundred and fifty five dollar bid contingent upon uh, the okay from FEMA allowing us to award it to uh, the second low bidder. So moved. Second. All in favor? All right. All right. All right. All right. I know it's a hard one to swallow because I'd like to give him the work, but I just feel in that case it's probably too much risk for us. Mm -hmm. um, so, evident. Uh, so, it, once once you ask FEMA, yep, and they say, okay, you're good, and obviously our our motion stands. Yeah. If for some reason FEMA says no, you must go with the low bidder. Then that's what we'll do. Then our motion is overturned. Is that? Well, the same thing happened last time when we decided that the low bidder was going to be McCullough. We awarded to both bids to McCullough on on um, Geico and Pump House, and then he pulled, but he pulled, 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 he pulled one. So right. he, you know, he's like, I like you bid on both. You won both, and he's like, Yeah, well, no, but I'm only going to do one of them. So right. then the next one just went to the next low bidder. So. Right. Okay. And if you could, you know, you have, you won't have an issue of discussing our theory behind the, the award or, or you can have. Oh, with him. FEMA? No, with Dylan. Oh, no, I don't have a problem. Or if not, you can have him come see me. I don't and have a problem. Them, no, I have no problem at all talking to them. All right. Everybody good with that one? Was there a, um, was there a new completion? date on the bridge installation with that bit? Like, yeah, on the bridge, it has to be in November, um, I think it was like 26, 24th, I don't, I don't have my, I don't okay. have FEMA schedule in front of me, I don't. Probably, I, I, don't. I just sworn I updated that, put it in your packet, but I'm not seeing it. Anyways, it's the end of November, and obviously you have to be out of the river by October 15th, that's why we need to. Oh, yeah, because of. Yeah, because the river work has to be done. By November 22nd. There you go. So October 15th, you have to be out, or yes, out of the river by October 15th. Okay. Any further discussion on that one? Okay. And the temporary bridge rental agreement. Everybody had an opportunity to read through that. So that's going to need a, a motion to authorize uh, Chris Jarvis as the chair to sign that. It only has one signature line here. 
So that's just for the rental of the yep. the bridge through Vtrans. So yep. that's that's one fifty. One fifty per month. Yep. And for a single lane. Um, hundred foot. Yep, that's you. Okay, I would entertain a motion to authorize myself to sign on behalf of the town for the rental of a temporary bridge from VTrans in the amount of one hundred and fifty dollars a month. So if you just pass this down, have Chris just sign. Chris just sign the top, and then I'll notarize your okay. signature on the bottom. All right, and then before I forget here, we added a few items to here. Um, we have we have an application um, for a coin draw uh, on behalf of the Humane Society, um, and the date in which they like to do it is the twenty first of September. Forward yeah, forward it's going to be a tough spot. We're going to have entertainment up there at the bank. Yeah. And I can see why they want to. Yeah. 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 That might be a little too so congested there. Be, uh, they do have a rain date for the 22nd. So that's Sunday. That would be better. I don't think there's anything planned on Sunday at the bank. Huh? No, I don't think so. Would shifting it up a little, like, closer to the school or closer to the GW? No, well, we in the past, we established that as a coin drop area is because of the lower, seems to be our lowest speeds are in around that area. Because the speed picks back up once you hit Pleasant Street. What time? Um, what, like, what's the time? They were looking for uh, 9 to 3. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 So, would... Do you think if we made a motion to approve it based on the rain date of the 22nd that they would have an issue with that? I'm sure they would, but... That's that they would have an issue with it? I'm certain they would. They'd or do they want to pick another date well, and come back for us? Or? They also usually put up a stand at the band shop, mm -hmm. um, a table, mm -hmm. and you get somebody dressed up like a dog or whatever. Mm -hmm. I would around. tell them that they get Sunday the 22nd. If that's not a date they want, they can come back. They're approved for the 22nd, but they could do okay. another day. Not the All right. I would entertain a motion to allow the Humane Society to set up a coin draw uh, based on the rain date of September 22nd from 9 to 3. Uh -huh. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I need to sign this. Yeah. And then we have, so we can get it, typically we just sign these, but we're going to make sure we get them into the meeting minutes. We have some uh, liquor licenses here. And, and one of these is for Tessie's Tavern, and the other one is for Toju's. Well, it's not Tessie's anymore. Yeah. Two, two roads, bar and grill. Yeah, it just says a DBA. I think yeah. it says uh, uh, Tessie's DBA as, or, or vice versa. Well, because they're leasing it to the new entity, so they may still have to hold the. Yeah, because uh, I think if you look at the license, license, it has a DBA on it. Oh, okay. Well, they're, yeah, they're saying Tessie's Tavern LLC on here. Right. And they may still be the. Right. Okay. So.
We had the select board meeting minutes of August 26. We have any notable changes or amendments to it, or are we good to approve it as written? You got one. You got one? Yeah, it says better move to adjourn the very second. <laughs> oh, that's, that's I think it was a, it was it was Brainerd. Yep. I was probably it just typing. Really I was typing away. <laughs> Which one was which? It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Baby. All right. So I entertain a motion to um, approve the meeting minutes of the twenty sixth as amended. All right. All in favor? Aye. Actually, actually, in here, it does say it right. Does it say it right? No. Okay. Hmm. Did we get it? It does. Is it the same? Yeah, I can well, see it. It's good if it's amended. Then it's the same. Great. Okay. okay. So, as it's, it's all in the book. Motion to approve. Okay. Okay. And there were a few other communications in our packet. The rec committee information. Just to kind of get an update of where he's at with the grant for the charging station. Well, there was some talk amongst themselves. He had come, had a note come to the board meeting, and then he talked to his committee, and so they haven't. They're talking about they have not requested time to come back yet. Okay. So there, I see. I get CC'd on stuff in between. They we want to see if within the month, next month or two, he comes back and just gives us an update on. Yeah. Because he's not the chair of that committee anymore. No. So, oh, okay. But I'll reach out okay. to him. Um, I'll ask. Because that would be helpful to um, just kind of see where they're at. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 I guess, I guess this is under other communications, but we had the current budget cost review in there. Mm -hmm. You have one of those. You didn't get that? Okay. The what? Okay. Yeah, it's in there. You in the dark. Not in my pocket. <laughs> what wasn't in your pocket? He's missing the budget, budget status report. But everybody else got it? No. no. Well, it's not fair. Here, Paul, I'll give you mine. It's in here. That's got to tell you something, Paul. I know. <laughs> I did have one question. Okay. Um, i got to find that. <coughs> I have, just to clarify. So under... Um, so you know, Paul, there's two in mine. <laughs> uh, I didn't I did not go in but here, so there you go. Maybe she put two in mine and none in yours. Sorry. If you have any questions, you know. <laughs> so I had a question in regards to uh, on page two of eight mm -hmm. under the Under the other public works. Yep. 
Could you just clarify the cemeteries? Uh, so clear. Yeah. So I had three. One was the cemeteries. That's um, a building. Okay. For, yeah. That's you know they've been paid for mowing. Okay. And then so under the the backhoe and the international. Those are loan payments that were made. So are those loan payments made? Because they're already at 100% of the year, they just made once. Yeah, year. they just made okay. once. Yeah. Right. Just want to make sure. All right. Other than that, everything seemed to be in line pretty good. Okay. Anybody else have any other questions? And we had the constable report. I don't know if we were all supposed to get some of the, the statistics. The data, statistics. Um, I think he did, he really likes it. all that, but it's important. Um, there was quite a bit of data there. Um, but uh, I think so you're thinking he just needs to be a little more concise and his and not giving you so much. Well, I think he was trying to share with us some. And these were like, uh, isn't it a little different pretty much every time you get a report? Uh, well, he had his regular reports in there, but he put in some, uh, a couple of pages of, I guess they, they would be like traffic stuff. Well, it's so the race, race data total, so it breaks down by race, it breaks down But by it had race. his information, and then it also had our prior constable's information. Sorry, Mark. I know, and I, I don't know if this is just maybe data that... I think he was just trying to give you guys some information on how many tickets he did. Yeah, that data stuff. that's collected at, yeah. yeah. But, I don't know, it was... It so was, you don't it need... It was information overload for me, but... So I'll just, <laughs> tell, I'll just tell him, you don't need the race data totals. I'll tell him, okay. On that, I did, uh, when I was talking with him today, because I said, Jesus, here, looks like you need to get some new tires for that thing. And, he just mentioned that um, he was able to pick up two sets of tires. He was. For yep. that cruiser that this, the state was going to throw away. Yep, from Joe. And so. He says they're perfectly good tires, and yep, so he's got two sets that he does. he's going to put one of them on here and a month. So that should save us some, some money. It does, yeah. Here, so. This could be what the savings and tires is and repairs that need to be done with the cruiser. So, yep. so wash out. But yeah, Joe was great about it. Yeah, said we can't. He has to get rid of them. We can't resell them. But mm -hmm. he gave them, so it was great. Yeah, so that worked it was out. Nice well. of him to think of us. So I have a couple of questions. I don't know if you can answer them, Teresa. On the thirtieth. So traffic control Camp Brook Road for six hours. Yep. Does that have to do with construction? Yep, and then we'll get reimbursed from that from Federal Highways. Yeah. And then the other one on the third, so he's got the radar okay, and then 8.30 on route to Camp Brook Road, Pleasant Street, but that was eight and a half hours, so what, what else? He did, did he um, he doesn't really say what. Right, what I think he, he did a bike race for somebody. He did a race, he did some, a, a detail for someone, so we'll get reimbursed for that as well. He's been trying to find a combination of ways to generate a little extra revenue for us and also give him some extra time in the community. So some of these like uh, being a part of uh, some of these contracted events, they'll pay for his services, which in return we collect some revenue, but you know, kind of gives him more time in the community as well. So. He was just talking to me. He thinks that he's going to be able to pull down a grant. I don't know if he talked to you about that, Therese, about pulling down a grant for some extra patrol time um, through the um, Rutland, the council. <coughs> yep. He thought that it would probably increase. I don't know, maybe an extra ten hours a week. Yep. The patrolling. Is that because he is? We so. we were unable to get our own equipment grant. You know, to do the, some of the um, put their ticket work, but um, the state had me put him in contact with the it was the Rutland County Sheriff. So he's basically in a subcontract from them. So um, he's working with them, and, and 
that'll be the case. He'll get some hours in Bethel through them since we weren't right. able to get our own contract. And those are more like targeted type yeah. events. They're like a, they're a DUI, DUI set up yeah. or, yep, mm -hmm. so. They call them OP, occupant, you know, occupant protection grants from who would call it. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. That's pretty good. Do we have any other business to come before the board? I'd like, to, make, I'd like to mention uh, the cemetery, Cherry Hill Cemetery, the uh, property owner just above it, Kirk White, has had that ditch redone. And uh, I'm not sure if he blocked the culvert or what he did to the culvert that was dumping water on this, onto the cemetery, but it looks plumb to me. So the water should come all the way to the road forward and go around the front instead of going down across the That was nice of him. Didn't come down the road and across the front. Well, there's a culvert that comes out about 30 feet from the road and goes in a diagonal, mm -hmm. which hits, hits the culvert, hits the ditch right in front of the cemetery. Mm -hmm. And that's when he's got a ditch too. So no longer will be going into the cemetery. Well, it shouldn't be. It should go. You should go all the way to the road side of that. That's great. But there's still not easy access to get into there. No, the other, that, that problem hasn't been fixed. No, yeah. they know about that problem. Okay, well, making progress anyways. I told them about that problem, so they're aware of it. Anything right. else? They've got to clean the downside of that culvert mm -hmm. that they did put in pretty soon. That's really plugged. <laughs> That's, there's a lot of culvert work that needs to be done. Anything else? All right, I entertain a motion to enter executive session to talk about personnel matters. Mm -hmm. So, 